Morning Valley Bible Church. Good to see you all this morning as we are on our second Sunday of Advent, the deeper magic of Christmas. And we're going to start this morning by reading some scripture. So would you turn with me to the book of Galatians? And we're going to look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. So Galatians 4, verses 4 through 8. Please turn with me to that passage, if you will. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness to give honor to the reading of his word. Would you stand as we read Galatians chapter 4? We're going to look at verses 4 through 8, the word of God. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. However, at that time, when you did not know God, You were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. And God's people said, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a word that never changes. We thank you for Jesus, the word of God, who came into the the world. And we thank you for this wonderful Christmas time. We pray, Father, that as we listen to your word this morning and delve into it, you would prepare us further for Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Christmas is a magical time, isn't it? When we say magic, I don't mean sorcery kind of magic. That kind of magic is forbidden in the Bible. But it's magical in the sense that it's full of wonderment and awe and enchantment, if you will, Uh, particularly for kids, right? Uh, They're the... The sounds, the, the music, the decorations, the trees, the cartoons, the myths of Santa Claus and reindeers and elves and all those things fun to imbibe in. And of course, there are presents for kids. What a, what a magical thing that is when they see their name on a present and they say, well, what's in there? Well, you can't open it. Well, why can't I open it? You can't open it until Christmas. But when's Christmas? You just have to wait. And that's what it's all about. That's what Advent is all about, waiting expectantly for Sunday morning and looking forward to that day. So it's full of magic in that sense as I walk off the step. <laughs> you know I was going to do that someday, right? But it is full of, uh, it's, it's full of incredible magic in which we, we see that, that, uh, that it's a wonderful time. It's just full of enchantment and, and, and wonder and excitement. It's lighthearted. It's exuberant. But there is a deeper magic. And the magic that we're talking about with, of Christmas is not to pretend, make believe of all the different things surrounding Christmas. The magic that, uh, the real magic of Christmas is the supernatural, that God really did send his son. And that was a supernatural event in all of history. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is, is magical from the beginning. And it's uh, really the story of C.S. Lewis used the idea of magic in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as a parallel to God's supernatural uh, power in the, in the message of the gospel. And many of the stories of his day, just like many of the stories of our day, were full of uh, heroes and, and people who did magic, whether good or for bad, like, like today, whether it's Star Wars or whether it's myths or legends or fairy tales or Harry Potter, whatever it is, stories are replete with, with magical creatures and magical beings. But all of those are part of a storyline that we see in all of history, but they all reflect the greater story, the real story of who Jesus is, that there is a real greater truth, a deeper magic, and that magic is Jesus coming to this planet. And it's supernatural, and that's what gives Christmas its awe and its wonderment. Um, The Lion and the Witch and the Wardrobe is magical from the very beginning, And if you don't know the story, it's very simple. 
there are these four children, um, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. They live in England during World War II. And during the time of the bombings, their parents send them away to the country to avoid the air raids, and they they live out in the country in this huge mansion owned by a kind of an eccentric professor. The kids are excited about this, and one rainy day they're playing hide-and-go-seek in in this, uh, this mansion, and the youngest girl, Lucy, hides in a wardrobe. She's hiding, playing hide and seek. She backs further and further and further into the wardrobe. Pretty soon she hears crunching and feels crunching under her feet. And feeling back, there's something prickly on her hands. And she turns around. She's in a forest. This forest came out of nowhere. It's, this is magical, right? This is the magic of the story. There is this forest, and she turns around and begins walking. And pretty soon there's a lamppost. And she walks toward the lamppost. And when she gets to the lamppost... A fawn comes by. We say fawn, I don't mean a deer, but this mythological creature from uh, uh, mythology that is uh, half man and half goat, and he's talking, and she, she strikes up a conversation with this fawn, and he says, come to my house and I'll feed you lunch. So she goes to the house of this fawn, this little hovel, and he feeds her a nice lunch, and he begins playing music for her, and she starts to fall asleep, and then he begins to cry. And she says, what is the matter? His name is Mr. Tumnus, by the way. What's the matter, Tumnus? Why are you crying? She sa- he says, I'm such a bad fawn. Well, why are you so bad? Because I was going to betray you. Betray me to whom? To the white witch. The reason it's always winter and never Christmas, this curse on the land of Narnia is that this witch who is evil cursed the land and it's always winter. So he is beside himself, but she forgives him and he lets her go and he walks her back to the lamppost and she finds her way back to the wardrobe and she comes through. She's been gone for hours and she says, here I am, I've been gone. They said, where have you been? Because it seemed like just a moment. The days later, Edmund, who is a nasty brother, he's really not a very kind person, finds his way into Narnia. And when he finds his way into Narnia, he meets the White Witch. And the White Witch recognizes right away, well, who are you? Recognizes that he is a a human being. And in Narnia, when human beings, when these children would come, it's a prophecy. When these, these human beings would come, they would signal the beginning of the thaw. And he's hungry, and the white witch says, well, I've got something I will feed you. And she pours out this magical concoction called Turkish Delight, and he takes of it, but it's cursed. And the more he eats, the more he wants. It's like being on drugs. He's addicted to this, and he wants more and more. And she says, you can't have any more until you bring back your siblings to the land because she wants to kill them so that Aslan does not come. So he goes back and pretends that he doesn't know anything about this, but eventually the four children find their way to Narnia through the wardrobe. And while they're walking through the forest, a beaver comes and starts talking to them. This is the place of magical animals, talking beasts. And they take, the, the beaver takes them to his home where we meet Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. They make this nice meal, and they begin to, to talk to them about, uh, about what is going on in the, the land of Narnia. And the land of Narnia is this, this wonderful place, and, and at this point, in chap, this is in chapter 7, and I want you to note that he, it, it takes seven chapters till we get to the point where Aslan is mentioned. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe but the wardrobe appears first, and then the witch, and the lion comes in chapter 7, and we don't even see the the lion until chapter 12. But the beaver is saying this. He has the handkerchief from Mr. Tumnus that was left behind because when they came into the land, they discovered that he had been arrested and turned to stone. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With these words, it held up to them a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise, till suddenly Lucy said, Oh, of course, it's my handkerchief, the one I gave to poor Mr. Tumnus. That's right, said me, the beaver. Poor fellow. He got wind of the, we got wind of the arrest before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to him, I must meet you here and take you to 
and hear the beaver's voice sink into silence. And he gave one or two very mysterious nods, then signaling to the other children to stand so close around that they possi- as they possibly could so that their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers, he added in a low whisper, they say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. They say Aslan is on the move, which brings us to our story today. Aslan is on the move. Yes, it's always winter, but never Christmas in Narnia. But that's going to change because Aslan is coming in. In chapter 7, we have this, the idea of these uh, talking bees saying Aslan for the very first time. And these kids don't know who Aslan is. They'd never heard of him. But the point is, it takes a long time in the story for him to appear, just like most stories, like the story of the Bible, if you will. We have all of these Old Testament prophecies, and it's about here that Jesus finally shows up, right? It's a good story because God builds the tension and he gives the backstory so that when Jesus comes, we understand why he came in the same way that we understand a little bit more about Aslan. Why was Aslan on the move? Why was it all of a sudden? Well, the children had come into Narnia. A prophetic clock began to tick. Their entrance signals the entrance of Aslan. And the time was right. Time was long, seemingly unending. There was winter. There was no joy. There was fear by some. And there was a time of silence in Narnia. It's very similar to the passage we read in Galatians, very similar to the time in which Jesus came into the world. In fact, um, C.S. Lewis was written a letter in 1961 from, by a fan, and she wanted to know why in the book The Silver Chair, um, Aslan had said that uh, Caspian had died and so had he. And here is what uh, C.S. Lewis wrote. What Aslan meant when he said that he had died is, in one sense, plain enough. Read the earlier book in the series called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and you will find the full story of how he was killed by the white witch and came again to life. When you have read that, you will know probably, you will probably see that there is a deeper meaning behind it. The whole Narnian story is about Christ. That is to say, I asked myself, supposing that there really was a world like Narnia, And supposing it had, like our world, gone wrong, and supposing Christ wanted to go into that world and save it as he did ours, what might have happened? The stories are my answers. Since Narnia is a world of talking beasts, I thought he would become a talking beast as he became a man here. I pictured him becoming a lion because A, the lion is supposed to be the king of the beasts, B, Christ is the Lion of Judah. And C, I'd been having strange dreams about lions at that time. (laughs) The whole series works out like this, and this is what he, he says. The magician's nephew tells creation and how evil entered the world. The lion and witch in the wardrobe is the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. That's what we're talking about. Prince Caspian, the restoration of true religion after corruption. The horse and his boy, the calling and conversion of a heathen. The voyage of the dawn treader, the spiritual life. The silver chair, the continuing war with the powers of darkness. And the last battle, of course, is the last battle against evil at the end of the world on the last judgment. And that's what the Chronicles of Narnia is all about. It's an allegory. If I were to put Galatians 4 that we just read um, together with what I know about the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis doesn't say that, but this is what I would, this is how I would see it. Verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth, forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Aslan is on the move. Perhaps he's already landed. Verse 5, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. They're constantly referred to as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. Verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, the the emperor beyond the sea is the the father God figure in the whole series. Verse 7, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. 
on the thrones of Caraparavel. Caraparavel is the idea of the kingdom of God where those who believe in the Lord will reign. And verse 8, however, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods, which is the white witch. So I think that matches up nicely with what we see in the Chronicles of Narnia. But what we see in Galatians, as we tell the story, is this. God's timing is always right. God's timing is always right. Verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time came, when the fullness of time came, the fullness of time, and so there was a time of silence in Narnia. There was a time of silence in the Bible. 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. The conditions were just Right, and the timing was God's. God worked throughout all of, of human history that this was the point in time that he would bring forth his son, just like Aslan is on the move. In the Roman Empire at that time, there was what was called the Pax Romana, which was the peace of Rome. They were, they were a very strong military country, and so there was peace throughout the land, and so peace throughout the land meant that there was a, when, the, when the gospel came, there weren't going to be any wars that would keep the gospel from spreading. There was also what was called the Roman road system, the Romana Via, Via Romana, excuse me. And, and Rome had built these roads throughout all of the Roman Empire, all the way from northern Africa over to Palestine, up and to the north, all the way to the British Isles. Someone did a, a this is a map that looks like a subway map of the Roman roads to show you how intricate the, the, the highway system was and, and the engineering feat that it was. And why is this important? So that when Paul went on missionary journeys and when the gospel spread, people could travel freely throughout the Roman Empire and plant churches all through the Roman roads which God allowed to happen. There was also what is called a lingua franca, a common language, Koine Greek. Throughout the Roman Empire, people spoke the same language. And if you've ever traveled abroad, you know how, how good that can be when you find someone who speaks English. But this would facilitate the preaching of the gospel and the spread of Christ and Christianity after Christ came. There was also, after these 400 long years, a sense of messianic hope amongst the Jews. It was a longing. It was a waiting. It was always winter, but Christ the Messiah never came. And they were longing for that time. And the prophet wrote, in fact, uh, Malachi wrote these words at the end of Malachi. He said, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But you, but for you who fear my name, and here's a line from uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, for you who, hear, who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. The Son of God is going to come, and he's going to rise, and he's going to heal us, and he's going to bring peace to the land. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, but they will be ashes under your soles of your feet on the day which I am appearing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb and for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the, the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that it will not come and he will not come and smite the land. He's looking forward to the ultimate end of all things when the Lord comes back and judges things and make them right. But in the meantime, the son of righteousness is going to come. He's going to rise from the dead, having suffered for our sins, and bring healing throughout the land until the restoration of all things. But at that time, the people were dispirited. This would continue for 400 years, always winter but never Christmas. So how exciting that the fullness of times had come. Jesus was on the move. Messiah has come. Have you heard? They say the Messiah has come. We don't know, but they, that's what they're saying. 
This new era was dawning, and there was, going, there was bound to be a change. And, and they say Aslan is on the move. Perhaps he's already landed in the same way that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son in the Gospels. There, is this, there are rumors and all sorts of ideas. Is this man really Jesus? Has he really landed on earth? The point is, is that God is sovereign over all of history And he prepared the coming of Jesus at that particular time in all of history. And if he's sovereign in history, is he not sovereign over your life? Does he not have control over the things that are happening in your life? Can he not be trusted? Of course he can be trusted. He has proven himself over and over and over again again to be a faithful and righteous God. And his timing is always right for whatever happens in your life. His timing is always right. But not only is his timing always right, God is always on the move. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. At the right time, he acted. He didn't just have a time frame, but when that that time came, he did something. He was on the move. So when we say Aslan is on the move, God is on the move, uh, it's another way of saying God is always working. And he is always working. Sure, there are times of silence, and it doesn't seem like he's working. Sure, there were 400 years of silence, but it didn't, and it didn't seem like he was working, but he had spoken to the prophets. His word was always fresh. It was always alive. And he sent his son. He was divine. He's the son of God. Born of a woman, he was also human. This is a reference to the, uh, the reference to the uh, uh, the virgin birth. He was, he was born under the law. He was a Jew. So he was prom- the promised one of Israel, the one that they were looking forward to for 400 years and before that from the time of Abraham, from the time of Genesis 3.15. He was the promised one of Israel. He was born under the law and he would fulfill the law and supersede the law in his death on the cross. So God is on the move. It's another way of saying, of course, that he's working. There was silence in Narnia. There was silence on the earth. But God was still working. And evil always makes the mistake of thinking that if God isn't acting, if I can't see him and hear him, then we can defeat him. That was the the mistake that the witch made. She is evil personified. She thought that she could continue to rule. If I can kill these children then the prophecies will not be fulfilled. Just like in the New Testament, Satan thought he could defeat the gospel. Of course not. God was always working. So faith is trust, an active trust, even when we don't see him, even when we don't hear him, even when we don't feel him or taste him or smell him. And that happens, doesn't it? Did it ever happen in your life where he seems far away and silent? And you pray, and your prayers seem to be bouncing off the ceiling. It doesn't mean he's not working. It doesn't mean he doesn't hear. The fault is yours. It's not his. That's when we humbly trust, and we just continue to move forward. And when he's on the move, in Narnia, the thaw begins. He's working, and there are signs of spring that are coming. The first thing, one, the thing that the, the kids see when they come into the land is a robin. What's the first sign of spring? A robin. That's the first thing that they see. This robin comes. And then Father Christmas appears. It's really unexpected, I think, in the story. What what is this Father Christmas coming about? To me, it's unexpected because you have this mythological feature, figure rather, mythological figure who comes in the middle of a fantasy story. So you're kind of mixing your fantasies. And it seems to be a little bit unexpected. But Father Christmas, at the time that... uh, Um, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote this, came from an English tradition. We mix up Santa Claus and Kris Kringle and Saint Nick and Father Christmas. But the idea of Father Christmas was an old, old Norse legend. And the idea of Christmas was, this was Christmas who was Christmas personified. In other words, Christmas comes in the form of a person. In England, there was a time where they outlawed Christmas and its celebration because it was pagan and it was Romish. In other words, it was Catholic. And so, therefore, we're not going to uh, celebrate Christmas. So later, Father Christmas became the idea that Christmas 
is going to come in the form of a person. And Christmas will be celebrated in spite of what others say. So Chris, the Christmas story, Father's, uh, Father Christmas, uh, 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 C.S. Lewis recognized that this, this figure is subservient to Aslan. And, and Father Christmas says, I've been trying to get here, or, uh, trying to get her for the longest time, but she, the witch, has prevented me from coming. And now Christmas comes, the personification of Christmas. And this is a classic example of Lewis's belief that all myths ultimately have truth to them and speak of God's truth. God is always working, and he uses many, many different means to, to demonstrate that. We also see in verses 5 and 6 of Galatians that God always redeems a remnant. He always redeems a remnant. So that he might redeem those who are under the law. That's why he sent his son. Redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. He redeems us. The purpose of Jesus coming was redemption. The purpose of Aslan coming to Narnia was redemption. Redemption is the story of this book. Redemption is the story of this book. But this book is about this book. Jesus is the one who brought real redemption. His plan was to adopt the unadoptables. That's us. And he always has his people from whom whom he redeems. And he always has his remnant. And even during those 400 years of silence, there were those who were redeemed. And they believed and they were faithful. Think about it when Christ came, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Joseph and Mary, Simeon, this man who waited for the consolation of Israel, Anna, the prophet, there are many believers waiting for the son of righteousness to come. And he's on the move. He's appeared, and the thaw begins. In our story, it's notable, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. There was hope amongst true believers in Narnia as well. This is a a, a couple. They, They lived the life of of industry and faith and hope in the future. They were righteous. They were patiently waiting for the lion to appear. They knew the prophecies. They knew the stories. They didn't give in to the spirit of the times. That is the evil. That is serving the white witch and everything that was opposite Aslan. They didn't imbibe in what was forbidden and all that the world of Aslan ha- or of the witch had to offer. And they were not hooked on Turkish delight like Edmund was. So we see the importance of Mr. and Mrs. Beaver because they're a reminder of us. Because we are now the the ones who are redeemed and we are the remnant waiting for the second coming of Christ. In spite of winter, in spite of the apparent silence, we can remain expectant and faithful and wise and good and searching out the kingdom of God as it comes. The last thing we see in verses 7 through 8 of Galatians 4 is God always saves the best for last. God always saves the best for last. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. When you become an heir, what is true of an heir? An heir is someone who's waiting for their inheritance to come. And they look for the day when they will have the full inheritance and the rights and the privileges and all that comes with it, whether it's material or or whatever. And we go from slavery to royalty as well. Therefore, you're no longer a slave. You become a son and an heir. No longer a slave, but we are those who will sit with him in his kingdom. And that's what we have to look forward to now. That's what they were looking forward to before Jesus came. And in the land of Narnia, that's what they were looking forward to as well, that Aslan would come and set up a kingdom and there would be a reign forever and ever. His plan was to take us from the lowest slaves to the highest sons of God, sons and daughters of God. We're no longer enslaved to those false gods. 
But God called to the hearts of these children. That is, Aslan called to the hearts of these children, just like God calls to our hearts. In, in the, the story, when after he says, Aslan is on the move, perhaps he has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one, which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful, you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now, At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in his inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. Remember? Aslan was calling to them calling to their hearts, peaking something within them, just as God does to us. How does God call on our hearts? How does he call out to us? He never leaves himself without a witness. Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glories of God. That's one of the ways that he calls out to us. You look into creation, you see, there's God. I see him, he's calling out to me. He's speaking to me in create creation. He also does so in our conscience. Romans 2 says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, the good things, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Everyone has a conscience and we know that it's right or we know that it's wrong and that's God calling out to us in some way. Not everyone responds. But there's also a sense of eternity. Sense of eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart. God has placed in us eternity. That is, eternal longings. There is this longing for, to, for a dream that we once had. We want to get back into it, and it's wonderful, and I want to get back there, and I want to live that. It's an echo of eternity. He has put that in our hearts. Like the children, there is always a longing in most people for there's something more. There's got to be something more. There's this undefined restlessness within us and a longing for completion, a longing for a home, for, for acceptance, for forgiveness. And you have this longing that is eternal, and an, e- an eternity of longing cannot be satisfied in a lifetime. So we, we have these things that we long for in this life, and people, and things, and, and circumstances, and all these things, and we long for them. They can never complete us here. It's only the eternal that can, can fulfill those longings that we have now. And that's what the children were feeling, and that's what it means to have eternity in our, in our hearts. There is this longing. Last week we saw the dreariness and the weariness And nothing satisfies because with the weariness comes a longing. And the recognition of the weariness of all things is the beginning of longing. We see I'm not satisfied. What does that mean? It means there's something else I want. And God uses this unease. And he uses this restlessness in our lives. I'm missing something. As Ken Boa says, restlessness is the pulley that God uses to draw us to his breast. He uses the difficulties, he uses the problems, he uses the, this world is weary. This world doesn't meet my needs, and God uses that to wean us from the world and to pull us to himself, that we might embrace that eternal truth of Jesus Christ. 
We have a longing God's placed in us. And that's what the children heard when they heard for the very first time the name Aslan. Something that the world can't provide because in the end, only God can fulfill this. Blaise Pascal made this remarkable statement. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim? But there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with the infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself deep longings of your heart that you feel? No one, no thing can fulfill them but God himself. So Christian, today, we don't despair, but we celebrate Christmas with the anticipation of what is to come. Regardless of the winter, we see, we will see in this world that, that hope is always abounding. God is ever present. He's always working. And he leaves in us this longing so that we will ever depend upon him. What keeps some from accepting this longing of Christ? Christ came into the world to redeem us. How did he do that? He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He died for our sins to buy us back, to redeem us. What keeps from some from grasping that truth and having that longing fulfilled? Sin. Second of all, pride, that unwillingness to admit and to hate your sin and to give it up, which is repentance. And what if you don't give it up? What if you don't? It will ever remain winter for you. There will be no Christmas, just a feigned celebration of someone else's king and lord. You'll, yeah, you'll taste the joy and taste the food and hear the music and it'll all be very stirring and give you a nice warm feeling, but it won't last because January will come and it's even colder. And your soul cannot be warmed or satisfied by anything but Christ himself. Philip Yancey put it this way, faith is, in the end, a kind of homesickness. For a home we have never visited, but have never once stopped longing for. Jesus put it this way, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Time is right. Jesus is on the move. Is he on the move this morning in your heart? Is he tugging at your heart? Is he pulling at you? He's on the move. Is he, the longing for Christmas that you have coming up in a couple weeks is, is a longing for something beyond Christmas. It's a longer for a deeper magic, and that is Christ himself. So I invite you to come to him and receive the gift of gifts from the Lord of Lords. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for this fanciful story which so well portrays the coming of Christ. And I pray that uh, if it has helped anyone here to understand this morning, their longing for Christ and sin in its way, that they would remove the barrier by repenting of sin, asking for forgiveness, placing trust wholly and only and completely in Christ, crucified, buried, risen and coming again. I pray, Father, that they would humbly now accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. In his name we pray, amen.